A smart person learns from his mistakes. A wise person learns from other people's mistakes. Now, with those words, I'm gonna kick off this video and I'm gonna share with you why my first five businesses failed miserably, at least in an economic sense. And hopefully you belong to the second category and you're able to learn from that. Now, before I start talking about the businesses that I used to run unsuccessfully, <laughs> I just want to share a statistic with you that I heard years ago and it stuck with me and I've been thinking about it over and over again for many, many years. Successful entrepreneurs have an average of 10 failed businesses behind them. 10 failed businesses. Now, I don't know how accurate this number actually is, but I think it's very inspiring and thought provoking. And I've been joking with it for years. Like every time I failed with one of my businesses, I'm like, oh, I could take another one off. So only five more to go, right? But fortunately, I didn't need to uh, <laughs> to get, get a 10 before I had success with my first business. But I do think it's a valid point um, to understand that even though you launch a business and you fail, maybe there's nothing wrong with you as long as you manage to learn something from it. But again, if you can learn from other people's mistakes, which is what I hope you'll do with this video, you may be able to not fail with any businesses at all. Now let's talk about my first business. Around 2006, I had this idea for a online t-shirt shop. I did some designs, some very cool designs. I still remember one of them was Julius Caesar and it's set with ancient writing uh, in marble. Um, vote Caesar for Senate. Nothing ever happened. Now I couldn't find any good deals on t-shirts. I couldn't find any good deals on prints and I couldn't actually really figure out how to successfully build a simple web shop without paying way more money that I would make from it. Now these things were of course a little more complicated back in 2006, but again, I gave up simply because I lacked persistence. Now the second company was called Viskdeco, which is Danish and means something that could be translated to whisper.com or whisper.com. It was basically a review site where I offered people to review books, restaurants, cafes, and I would have, I had an army actually of people working for free for me. Uh, and they would go as food critics kind of undercover to restaurants and I had deals in place with restaurants and cafes to reimburse me uh, once the review was uploaded. And it was, it was actually pretty good and original idea and because it was in the middle of the financial crisis of 2008, a lot of people were willing to work for free simply because they weren't able to get anything on their resumes. So I ended up getting like 150 applications for this unpaid job and I hired 15, 20 20 people, something like that. And things were running, but I didn't have a viable monetization plan. And I didn't really have a, um, I think it was too passionate. I was too passion driven with this specific project. It was almost like I didn't realize, well, you're running a business. You need to be persistent, number one, and you can't do everything yourself. Now, of course, I hired these people to do the reviews, but I still, I did proofreading on everything. I, um, yeah, I basically approved everything and I even did web design and I'm not a web designer. I even did a little HTML, stuff like that. And I was just, I was trying to do way too much and I gave up way too early. The idea was really great and original. I still think it's a good idea, um, but I assumed that I could get businesses and private individuals to pay me a flat fee before I had even built a reputation for the platform. Basically, yeah, before the services I offered had a value. And that was my mistake. I didn't understand what it took and I was trying to do too much in too little time and I grew impatient. The third business model was a different type of business. It was called Ferie which translates roughly into vacation in the past or something like that. This was around 2009. And what I wanted to do is I wanted to offer people an alternative to a regular holiday in Acapulco or Spain or wherever people normally go in your territory. So I would offer people an alternative experience where they could travel back in time to the past and basically have a, <laughs> have a, a, a different sort of vacation basically. But honestly, and I should have known all along, there was 
almost no market for this. Now, I had some good connections back then. Uh, there was, someone gave me a shout out to a on his huge email list. And I did get a few commitments, a few signups, but I didn't understand that I'm passionate about this. And maybe I know one or two other people that are, but there's no market for this. You can't, you can't force a new market on people. If there's no demand, there's really no reason for you to create a supply. I did manage to back out of it before I invested any money and not that much time. But again, I did spend several hundred hours that I could have spent better. You know, I didn't achieve anything other than, of course, a few hard earned lessons. The fourth business was around 2010. It was called ID Files and it was an alternate reality game, a very comprehensive system that I was working on. I had a developer friend who was doing the programming for me. It was like a mixture of online and offline, all these weird things, uh, this very elaborate network of people interacting with each other, etc., etc. And again, my main mistakes here were, were that Again, lack of persistence, I ended up giving up. And number two, I tried to do everything alone. And those two things were actually intertwined. Because I didn't reach out to other people that could help me with these tasks that were also passionate about this pretty crazy idea, I ended up having to do pretty much everything myself, not the web development. Thanks, Peter, for that. <laughs> Even though we never, nothing ever came from it, we did create a couple cool logos and stuff, but that's pretty much it. But lack of persistence. I didn't have a realistic understanding about if you want to create something new, especially if you want to create a new market that isn't really already there, you need to really accept the fact that this may take years. And I wasn't able to, I wasn't able to accept that at the time. Now, the fifth business was called the Selfie Awards. I had this idea to create an app where people could upload selfies and vote for them. And the apps with the highest scores would qualify for the next month. They would be transferred over and we would have at the end of the year, one big vote. And I would have an award show and the best selfie photographers and artists um, would then be awarded in different categories and people could vote for them. And it basically, it was just a whole lot of fun. I actually came pretty far along with this idea. I hired an Indian company to do the programming and they did develop this app. It took, it took almost a year, I believe, or something like that, but they did deliver the final product. But alas, Apple turned it down in the in their app store because they found it offensive to rate people. Um, and I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> you have all these other, uh, you know, I think this was after the launch of dating apps where people constantly swipe like, oh, no, 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 no. If that's not rating other people, I don't know what is. But my point here is again, I thought that because Apple didn't approve this app being in the Apple app store, it was game over for me. These days, I know I could have used social media. I could have used other ways to spread this app and it would have probably been a, been a success. Now, honestly, I still own the copyright and the trademark for the selfie awards. So I think maybe, maybe if I can find the time in the future, I would possibly pursue this idea again because I think it's original and fun. But the reason I chose not to was because I found myself in a situation where I had momentum. I just started my other YouTube channel called In It For The Money about cryptocurrencies and then cryptocurrencies took off. They basically exploded and I realized, I, oh my God, I could cre create an entire business around this idea. So I did and it's still running and I'm still making decent money from that. Now, what are some of the common denominators of my failures with these five businesses? Now, first of all, as I've already stated a couple of times, I more often than not, I assumed that I could do everything myself. I think as I write in my recent book, Spiritual Capitalism, I think that a lot of smart people, and I do realize I'm calling myself smart here, so bear with me. I do think it's normal for smart people to, th to think that they can and should do everything themselves, but it is completely, it's silly 
It's foolish. It really, truly is. An example I use in the book is, so I used to, like, if I was interested in buying a new uh, book of some sort, I would never buy the new book. I would go online and I would spend maybe an hour searching for a discounted used paperback version of that book. There's nothing wrong with that in and of itself. But ultimately, looking at the results, I would typically save, let's say, $5. And I would typically spend an hour doing so. That basically means that I'm paying myself five bucks an hour. And why would I do that? I wouldn't take a job at five bucks an hour. So why would I do this other thing? I would waste my time. And that's the thing. These things are typically intertwined. Doing everything yourself isn't stupid because you can't do everything yourself. You could probably teach yourself the skills that are necessary to do all sorts of things. Could be web development, could be programming, could be marketing, could be all sorts of skills, even more tangible skills, physical skills. But you have to ask yourself, you have to look at it in a bigger perspective and ask yourself, does it really make sense for me to spend all this time looking at the return, the reward I will get if I do this myself, if, if I spend these hundreds of hours acquiring these new skills? Typically, the answer is no, it makes no sense at all. So watch out. And this goes for knowledge as well. Smart people tend to think that, okay, yeah, maybe there's some industry-specific knowledge that I could acquire, but I probably don't have to because I'm actually pretty smart. But that's a mistake. You're, an, you're, you're a fool if you think like that. And I used to until not that long ago. But if you can learn from my mistakes here, you're well on, on your way to success. I really mean that. Now, the other thing has to do with persistence. But... This, it's actually a little misleading that I call it persistence, but it's because it's not just about being persistent. Oh, just, oh, yeah, just keep pressing and move on. What I had, the epiphany I had, and the epiphany that's really the centerpiece of this book is the first two doctrines of spiritual capitalism, as I call them in the book. And number one is you have to work for yourself now. And when is now? Well, now is always now, and it's also always, always. You have to work for yourself. That's number one. But you can't just work, expect yourself to do that from day one. You need to motivate yourself somehow. And what I do is I suggest in the second doctrine that you make the rules and follow them. You have to make rules for yourself because if you don't, you will follow other people's rules. Let me just repeat that. If you don't make rules for your own behavior you will automatically follow other people's rules. And that is not favorable for you. And that is indirectly something that I used to do my entire life. And until I had this epiphany with the three doctrines of spiritual capitalism that I describe in my book that you could pick up on Amazon at five bucks, 38 cents, using the link below. Yeah, I, I didn't really achieve anything. I achieved a lot of things um, halfway, but nothing never really happened because I didn't have a smart system to push myself to being persistent. And it's not, it's not, and if you're thinking right now, oh yeah, but I know how to be persistent. I know how to motivate myself. You can't just keep trying to trigger motivation in yourself. You need a system for how to do it consistently so you don't start from scratch every single time you try to do it. And that is what I describe in spiritual capitalism. Now, there's actually one exception to these failed businesses, and that was the very first business I ran when I was eight back in 1989. I realized I just gave away my age there, but when I was eight, I would collect these comic books that were um, published back in Denmark, where I grew up. They were, they were called jumbo books. They were very small, um, ironically. But I would collect them, and I really wanted all of them. And one day, I used a service um, akin to Craigslist. It was like a paper version of Craigslist, and it was free, and you everybody could place ads in there. It didn't cost anything. You could call people, sell and buy stuff. But instead of buying all these relatively expensive comic books in a store paying full premium for them i would buy them used using this newspaper now what happened was i ended up having <laughs> doubles of many of these books so i had i had an entire collection and then i had oh, but book number 21 and 41 and 47 and 48 i have two of those or in some cases even three of them and i realized i could sell them 
I could sell them in this using the same newspaper where I bought them. And then I realized there's always, every single week, there's people selling these books at five kroner, a little less than one dollar. And there's always people, other people, selling them at seven or eight kroner. There's a huge arbitrage arbit opportunity here. I certainly didn't use those words back then. Um, but I realized that was there was an opportunity there and I moved on it. So I actually ended up buying bags and bags and bags of these books. I would always buy them at four or five kroner and I would always sell them at seven or six kroner if I had to in some, in some rare cases. And I would make a lot of profit. And I actually spoke to my dad just recently and he told me, and I completely forgot about this, that the reason this business venture of mine ended was that my parents told me we can't have this constant stream of strangers, you know, adults and kids alike, showing up selling books and or buying books. It was too much. But it it does go to demonstrate that I was passionate about it initially. But the reason I kept being passionate about it was actually simply because I was operating in a market with a natural demand and hardly any competition. And these days, that's very hard to find. But at least some of the businesses, the examples I mentioned in this video, my vacation in the past and my alternate reality game, there is no natural market demand for that. And I will. I will definitely rec uh, recommend that for your first couple businesses, aim for a business with some type of natural demand. You cannot sell, well you can of course, but it's harder to sell products that you first need to create a demand for. That is very tricky. All right, stay tuned on this channel. I'm gonna do a video soon on digital products, which is something that of course can be sold online. and. Um, also, please subscribe to this channel. It's completely free to you and it's really helpful to me. And by all means, go pick up Spiritual Capitalism on Amazon, five bucks, 38 cents. There's really no excuse not to read it. Thanks for watching. Until next time, cheers.